Thanks, Joe. Hey, uh, hi, and welcome everyone to another Myra Capital Group um, educational webinar. Today's webinar subject is managing risk with defined outcome ETFs. Um, as you know, we always are trying to find ways to mitigate volatility in our clients' portfolios, but especially in our conservative client portfolios, especially with this year being um, not the year of fixed income, which usually serves as a great buffer for our uh, portfolios, um, as conservative portfolios, which of course did not happen this year. In fact, you probably have to go back to the mid seventies for the last time that both fixed income and stocks were both down double digits. Um, so we wanted to find a correlated um, investment that was low, lower correlated to the broad market with no interest rate exposure, that's liquid, cost effective, together with a defined outcome. And what we found was the innovator buffered ETFs with a specified dividend outcome. So to really get into the weeds, I'd like to introduce Tim Urbanowitz. I hope I didn't chop that thing up, Tim, sorry. That was good. I, that was good, all right. Tim is the head of institutional strategy for Innovator Capital and also Joe Casey. Joe is the external sales consultant for the Northeast region for Innovator ETFs. So Joe, why don't you kick it off? Yeah, great. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for the introduction and uh, very grateful to be, to be partnering with you and appreciate everyone taking a few minutes of the day uh, to learn a little bit more about these. Um, just a little bit of background to get us started. Uh, what do we mean by these defined outcome or buffer ETF? So hear those terms, uh, who is innovator? So when we talk about defined outcome ETFs, that's, that's sort of an umbrella term. So that's a broader term. And specifically our niche and what we're gonna be focusing on today is what we call buffer ETFs. And you know these, these sort of defined outcome strategies have been around for a long time. Uh, institutions have been using these types of strategies. You've seen them in things like structured notes, you've seen them in annuities. Uh, these types of you know, different ways of defining your parameters, defining how you're investing, defining your time frame and what your risk level is uh, has been around for a long time. Uh, now, Innovator was founded in 2017 um, by the original founders of the firm PowerShares, which many of you may be familiar with. Um, one of the early, one of the, the, grew to one of the largest ETF issuers in the marketplace. And our founders sold that business off to Invesco, went into retirement, and uh, basically planned on staying there. Um, and one of them, John Souther, one of our founders, was, uh, was brought by his personal financial advisor, one of these types of defined outcome investments in a different wrapper. And having deep roots in the ETF world, um, he, you know, he thought about some of, some of what these payoffs, what they were offering and thought they were attractive, uh, but there was a problem. Um, you know, there, there are some inefficiencies to, to other wrappers and not always that they're inefficiencies, just maybe that they're not appropriate for all investors at all times. So things like, you know, lockup, surrender charges, credit risk, illiquidity, the ETF wrapper solves for a lot of those things. Um, and so essentially what our founders did was take these payoffs that have been used um, for years and years now and marry them with some of the efficiencies that the ETF wrapper brings. Um, so fast forward a few years and you know, we are the, the founder and the leader of this defined outcome or buffer ETF space, uh, manage a little over $8 billion in these um, and continue to grow and continue to, to innovate and launch new products as our, uh, as our name Innovator Capital Management might infer. Um, and we do this not by ourselves, we do partner with a firm called Milliman Financial Risk Management, uh, which is a very large global actuarial firm who have been working with institutions to run these types of strategies and these other wrappers. Uh, so we tapped really what we consider the, the top in the marketplace to help us bring these buffer ETFs uh, into the ETF or these buffer strategies into the ETF wrapper. Um, so more specifically, why did we want to bring these at, you know, at a high level? That's that last slide was, you know, kind of talking about the background. 
Uh, but specifically, what do we think is, is the benefit? What is the reason to even consider these? And first and foremost is risk management. These, are, these buffer ETFs are all about risk management. And I'll take just a moment to give a brief overview of what we mean when we talk about buffer ETFs. We'll get into the specifics, um, but just to give you a sort of an understanding of as we get into this, you'll hear these terms. What a buffer ETF does is give you the exposure, give you exposure to an underlying asset or an underlying index, something like the S&P, up to a known cap during a known time frame. In our case, we use one-year time frames for the most part. And then you have a downside buffer. So what that means is you have a defined level of risk that you're taking off the table. Um, you're limiting your losses to the downside in exchange for foregoing some of your upside potential. So this is a, you know, in terms of risk management, as Tom said, you know, this has been, uh, you know, front of mind for a lot of investors um, in recent years, and especially this year, where our sort of go-to risk management tool, i.e. bonds, um, have not been providing the type of risk management uh, that they once did. Um, so that's that's been largely, you know, the the reason for bringing these to the market was was risk management. There's there's a need right now for risk management, innovation in risk management. Number two is capital preservation. So that uh, in simple terms, you know, people don't want to make their money twice. Uh, so there's there's always a, a need and a desire to preserve that capital and have the ability to grow it. Um, so. So that's fulfilling that need. And then def dependability, um, you know, there's a lot of different strategies out there that, you know, sometimes in certain environments or based on historical correlations have provided great risk management. But we've seen a lot of that break down um, through COVID and, you know, in this current market environment. A lot of the a lot of the ways that we've managed risk, not just bonds, you know, other you know types of switching strategies, low volatility, whatever it is, they haven't always uh, proven true. And one of the nice things about a buffer ETF is that we're not relying on these past correlations, not hoping that some sector remains lower volatility. There's no one pulling the strings behind the scenes, actively managing something to try and deliver. Uh, some sort of risk managed strategy. Uh, we're relying on the math of options uh, to deliver that in a very reliable and a dependable way. And lastly, uh, as I said before, bringing these types of payoffs into the ETF wrapper uh, was really our, our innovation and what we've brought to the table in this space. Um, you know, there are other wrappers where you can, other types of investment vehicles where you can access these types of payoffs but they may carry credit risk. Uh, they may be illiquid. You may have lockup fees and surrender charges and the ETF wrapper solves all of those. So those are, are the four main reasons that we brought them to market. Now, the, the first one that we talked about was, was addressing risk. So managing risk, what type of risk are we talking about? What type of risk do buffer ETFs address? Uh, and the first is, is you know, fear of equity downside. That's always there. That's always front of mind for many investors. Stocks don't just always go up. Equities don't always go up. Um, so that fear of, of equity downside uh, is front of mind. And in this current environment uh, where we're seeing rising rates, uh, again, that go-to risk management tool, uh, bonds, has become more challenging. So as we see rates rising, uh, that poses a great risk to investors, especially those at or near retirement uh, who may not have uh, the stomach or the risk tolerance uh, to be heavily weighted in the equity markets and take that type of volatility. Um, so rising rates poses a, 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 a very big risk to investors right now. Um, the potential for lower future equity returns. Uh, we've had you know, the, the 2010s were a tremendous run for equities. We had a tremendous bull run. Um, can we expect the sort of returns out of equities that we once did? Uh, we don't necessarily know that. And I think Tim will highlight a couple of things that we're seeing in the market right now that, uh, that may, you know, give us concern for lower future equity returns. 
Uh, and then the one that's making headlines uh, most often, more recently, is inflation. Um, we saw you know a little bit of a uh, little bit of air coming or a little bit of breathing room there in inflation numbers today. But in any case, inflation is still uh, near historic highs, and that poses a great risk for investors who um, you know as they approach retirement or in retirement um, still need that that buying power. Um, they need to grow their assets in a way that you know, helps them keep pace or outpace inflation. Uh, so that's a tremendous risk right now. Uh, and then lastly, clients fearful to invest. We, we're seeing record cash on the sidelines. I think a lot of these are, are sort of interconnected in a way, you know, that, that fear of, of equity downside, um, keeping a lot of investors on the sidelines right now. Um, so all of these things are, you know, like I said, somewhat interconnected, but these are the risks that we're seeking to address with buffer ETFs, and we'll talk a little more uh, about what that means more specifically as we go forward. So that's where these came from. That's why they exist and, and what they solve for. Um, so more specifically now, what are they? So what do we mean by defined outcome investing? Uh, really just five key aspects to it. Um, number one, we're gonna pick an index or pick some underlying asset that we're tracking. Uh, and then we're going to define our time frame. How long are we investing for? How, how long are we wanting to, to set these parameters for? Um, and then how large of a buffer, how much protection, how much of a hedge uh, do we need? Um, and then the cap. Well, the cap, you'll see it's, it's variable. Why is that? Well, it depends on what's going on in the marketplace. Um, these are options-based products. So as the pricing in the options market changes based on things like volatility, based on moves in interest rates, you're gonna see that the caps on these things vary. So we're always gonna keep that buffer level consistent um, through our product lineup. We do 9%, 15%, and 30% buffers. But depending on you know, what your starting point is, you may see some variance in the caps for those reasons. And then lastly, your rebalance frequency, are you gonna uh, is this going to be actively managed? Is it going to be just, you know, allowed to, to reach the end of its outcome period? Um, so for our purposes, you know, we do buffer or defined outcome ETFs. Um, in this case, I've, I've put SPY as an example, SPY, which is an S&P 500 ETF. So that's one way uh, we can, you know, get access to, um, you know, investing in or get exposure to the S&P 500 we typically do one year outcome periods with all of our products. We have a few in the lineup that have different outcome periods, quarterly outcome periods, uh, but by and large, we're dealing with one year products. Then set your buffer level for our purposes. We do a 9%, a 15% and a 30% buffer. And something that I'll, I'll touch on more as we sort of zoom in on uh, more and more on what these products are, what they do, uh, this 30% buffer, I'll note, is a little bit unique in the way that it's constructed, where a 9% and a 15% buffer are designed to mitigate that first 9% of losses in, in this case, in SPY, or that first 15% of losses in SPY over that one-year period. Our 30% buffer is actually what we call a shifted buffer, where you're exposed, the investor is exposed to that first 5% of losses in the S&P and then has a full 30% buffer. So negative five to negative 35 after that. So just a quick note on that. And then caps, again, those will vary from outcome period to outcome period. And we rebalance these once a year at the end of their outcome periods. Um, so those are really the, the five components of defined outcome investing. Um, and we'll, we'll get into some of the specifics of what our lineup is and, uh, and what it looks like um, but just to give you a sense of, of what these do, uh, what's, what's the point of these in the marketplace? Um, so here's an example of, of a few different buffer levels versus just the broader market, the S&P here um, in this sort of yellow bar here. So this is showing a few different scenarios. What would my buffer ETF look like if the market went to zero? I'd say this is probably a little bit of a, we wow. probably have- Wow, we probably, okay, thanks. That's, that's a cold slap in the face to zero. Woof. 
I think, Tom, we'd probably have bigger problems than uh, looking yeah. at what's going on in our portfolios. But the buffer that's, works. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. I'm only down 91%. So, right. So, I mean, not maybe more of a hypothetical here, um, but, you know, just to give you a sense of, of what we're talking about, you know, if the market were really to, to tank here, if you've got a 9% buffer, market's down 100 a 9% buffer is design, designed to be down 91% uh, in that case uh, before fees. So you would see that, that outperformance to the downside um, by the amount of your buffer. With a 15 buffer, if the market's down 100, down 85. With a 30 buffer, market's down 100, down 70. So pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, and that's, that's really why buffer ETFs are used. You know, you're mitigating that downside, a more realistic uh, large market decline, something like a 30% decline. Again, you're seeing that outperformance by 9%, by 15%, or what would be 30%. But remember that 30 buffer is structured slightly differently. So you see a 30% buffer would be down 5% in that scenario. And then these sort of moderate market dips that you see here, uh, again, same math, market down 10. If you've got a nine buffer, that's designed to be down one before fees. A 15 buffer would be designed to be flat. And again, that 30 buffer would be exposed to the first 5% of losses. Now in an up market, we're still tracking to the upside. So by the end of your one year period, you expect these to match one for one, the upside of, you know, in this case, we're looking at the S&P 500 or SPY. Um, you would expect to match that up to your cap. So that cap is telling you what's the maximum that you can possibly make. And this is just you know, hypothetical, these caps will vary. Um, so this is not indicative of you know, where cap levels are right now. They're actually, um, we're in a higher cap environment than what this would indicate. Um, but in any case, you know, if the, the market here, if the S&P is up 20%, you know, the, this would show in this case, a 9% buffer with something like a 14% cap. A little higher than that now, um, but that you know, gives you an idea of something getting capped out. So at some point, you know, you're participating in the upside, all of the upside that that underlying asset gives you by the end of your one-year period. Uh, but at some point, you will get capped out you know, because the strategy, again, is effectively selling off some of our upside potential to buy that downside hedge in the form of a buffer. That's, that's how they work. Now, how do we deliver this? How does this actually function? What's under the hood to be able to, to make these function in the way that they do? Well, I will, I will tell you, I am, not, uh, I am not some kind of, you know, Black Shoals options expert. These are options-based products, uh, but it's a pretty simple, uh, it's a pretty simple option strategy um, that we use here. And you can really think of it in three layers. The first layer being market exposure. So we could do this simply by, you know, buying an S&P 500 ETF like SPY. Um, instead, we actually do it synthetically with options. And there's a couple of reasons for that I won't get into uh, in too much detail now. But layer one is that market exposure. Layer two is a put spread. So we're buying a put right at the money. And then for a 9% buffer, we would then sell a put 9% out of the money or for 15, 15% out of the money. So we're establishing those parameters and we can use the math of options to really dial in how much risk do we want to take off the table? How much risk are we willing to take in the market? So that second layer is the put spread that gives you your buffer. And the last layer here is our cap. So essentially what we're doing with layer one and layer two, you know, layer two, especially, you know, we've, we, layer one, we've, we've got our one-to-one -one exposure. Layer two, we're then having to spend uh, to buy that, that downside buffer, that, that costs something, that protection is not free in the marketplace. So we have to raise the necessary premium to cover the cost of that put spread making it a zero cost option strategy that participates one for one in the upside up to a cap and has the buffered downside. So that's sort of a quick taste of, 
of what's under the hood. Um, that's something if you'd like to go in more detail, we certainly can, um, but that's, that's how these things function. And now, Tim, um, if you wouldn't mind jumping in here, uh, we're gonna spend a couple of minutes talking through, you know, while we've looked sort of high level, what are these things? Why do they exist? Why do we bring them to the market? You know, what risks are they addressing? Um, Tim's gonna talk through some of the risks and some of what we're seeing in the market specifically right now uh, that makes these products relevant. Great, thank you, Joe. Um, so really, when, when you look at uh, managing portfolios right now, I, I, I continue to argue that this year is one of the most difficult difficult times to, to, to do that, simply for the fact that when you look at the, the biggest risks to the equity market, you know, your risk asset sleeve in the portfolio, those are the exact same risks that we see on the fixed income side of the portfolio or that 40 percent here. And you're looking at these two risks right here with inflation and the Fed. Uh, this is probably my favorite chart of the year here. Um, and I think it really highlights the situation uh, that we're in. We've been highlighting this really all year long. Um, two things that we're looking at in this graph. Uh, number one is we're looking at the, the federal funds rate. Uh, and we're comparing that with the yellow line, which is, or I'm sorry, Fed fund rate is, is the yellow line with the, the teal line there, which is, uh, that is the CPI in the US. So the, the rate of inflation. And we're applying that back, you know, several decades here. And if you look all the way to the right-hand side in that circle there, um, we have never seen these two as disconnected as they are now. Said another way, we've never seen the Fed this far behind the curve in history. Um, if you look historically, the, the typical gap that we see between inflation and the federal funds rate is about negative 1%. Right now, we see, even after uh, the latest hikes, we're still at about a 7% gap between the two. So big disconnect that, that we're seeing here. The other thing that I think is really interesting uh, on this chart is if you look at all those dots on, on the chart, the gray dots and the green dots, what those dots represent is it shows every time the Fed has started and stopped a hike cycle historically. Um, and if you look, we have never had a point in history when we've had inflation that has been this high, in fact, north of 5%, where the Fed has began a hike cycle and been able to execute that hike cycle without putting the US into some kind of recession. So when we look at the inflation picture right now, this is obviously the, the thing everybody is looking at. It's the most important thing for the financial markets, simply for the fact that we need to figure out how long is the Fed gonna need to leave policy in a restrictive territory to be able to get inflation under control. Now, obviously, today we had some, some good news. Inflation came in uh, better than anticipated. But just to put this in context for you, if you, if you think about today's reading, uh, we came in flat, right? Plus 0% month over month. Uh, if we were to see that exact same situation play out every single month until the first quarter of next year, that would put CPI down to 3.1%. So still above the Fed's 2% target. Um, so we have a long way to go in, in this battle. You know, I, I think everybody's caught on to the fact now that the Fed was a little bit late in starting to address a lot of the inflationary pressures that we've seen. Uh, but when you look at, again, when in the context of the portfolio, what is so challenging right now, when you look at this picture, uh, the, the, the remedy in, in higher interest rates is a detriment to the typical tool that we use to hedge our portfolios in bonds. So this is one of the reasons we need to look outside of those traditional, the, the traditional lens of risk management to be able to find other methods to be able to, to protect our portfolios. Because in reality, moving forward, you know, what, what does this really mean? Is it's likely gonna keep putting pressure higher, uh, of, uh, putting upward pressure uh, on interest rates. And if we do you know, see, the, see the economy tick into a recession, that obviously uh, historically has not been good for the equity markets. Joe, if you can go to the next slide here. 
I think this is, uh, yeah, this is, this is, this is really telling. If you look at the chart here, uh, you know, and again, there still is that hope that the Fed can pull off a, a soft landing. Really, we, I, we, we describe it in, in uh, really three different buckets to clients. There's really one of three scenarios that we can see play out here. One, you have the Fed that continues to tighten. They tighten uh, to the point where we have a meaningful pullback in growth. We have a meaningful pullback in employment. You see some varying uh, degree of severity of a recession play out, and that recession triggers inflation to, to finally come back down towards that 2% target. Uh, that's scenario one. Scenario two would be you have the Fed that continues to tighten. They tighten, they tighten, they tighten, um, and inflation remains stubbornly high. It's, it's, it, you know, it's not necessarily coming down, and they have to keep policy restrictive for a longer period of time. Arguably, that scenario is, is the worst for uh, the equity markets because that could bring us into a more severe economic situation down the road. And then the third and, and final option that we see is that soft landing, right? The Fed tightens policy just enough to start to bring inflation back down, slow growth, but not kill it. Now, is this likely? No, but is it possible? Yes. Uh, and that's why you know, we are so adamant that you still, despite all the risks that, that I think are very well known in the market, we still need to maintain meaningful upside exposure to the equity market because you could see meaningful upside, you know, should that third scenario play out. Again, probably the least likely scenario to play out, uh, but it's still a possibility. But going back to that, that first scenario here, I would say, you know, this is, this is uh, far and away our base case. You look at the, uh, you know, the median economist forecast, you have about 70% of economists that see a recession coming in the next 12 months. Really, even uh, before we saw the big rip in the equity markets that we've seen over the last uh, you know, couple months here, equities were really not ever pricing in anything more than a, a mild, a very mild pullback in growth. And to put this in a historical context here for everyone, I think there's two things to look at. One would be the level of valuations that we're seeing in the equity market. Two would be the level of earnings growth that is expected from the equity market. And starting with that first piece, when you look at what's being priced in uh, from a valuation perspective here, that table on the left highlights every single recession that we've seen, or oh, the last 10 recessions, I should say, that we've seen in the US, the valuation that the, the S&P 500 was trading at when the recession began, and the valuation that the S&P 500 was trading at when that recession ended. And the interesting thing here, if you look at where we're being valued today, you're right around that 19 times uh, earnings mark here, that is significantly above where we've seen the, the market price in prior recessionary periods. If you look at that, the average and the median on the bottom there, you, know, you can see you know, kind of right around that 14 to 15 times earnings is typically where we've traded in recessionary environments. So right now we don't have the equity market uh, that is signaling that we are heading into a recession. The bond market is, you look at the, 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 uh, you know, the, the inverted curve that we have here, where you have the two-year yield that's higher than the 10-year yield, you know, that's, that's been 100% spot on historically. So you have the bond market that's pricing that recession in, but we really haven't seen that sentiment uh, translate in a meaningful way to the equity market, which again, if scenario one plays out and we do see some type of recession play out, that could you know, uh, obviously create a little bit more uh, pain on the equity side, or at least a little bit of additional volatility that we see here. Hey, Tim, the second thing, yes. Good question. Sorry, go I, ahead, I think what's interesting here too is, is that back in um, the 81, 82 scenario is that the 10 um, year treasury was at 13%, along with the low multiples, along with uh, a 5% dividend yield on the, on, the on the Dow at that point. I mean, it was, Valuation yep. was so cheap back then. Uh, but how do you feel about when you look at the scenarios of oil spikes? We, I mean, we have never had a soft landing when it came to the oil spike that we're seeing, whether it's 73, 74, um, you know, 79, 80, and then of course, 2008, when we finally had demand destruction. So, I, I mean, that kind of also puts the odds against a soft landing because of the oil spike that we've seen. I, I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right, Tom. And I think it, it really comes down to the fact that that is putting tremendous pressure on U.S. consumers 
you know, if you look at consumer spending, that accounts for about 70% of GDP growth uh, in the U.S. Um, so when you start to put that type of pressure, you know, from, from energy prices, from, uh, you know, other pockets of inflation that we're seeing here, when you look at the, the uh, you know, rents, you know, some of the stickier pockets, there is a tremendous amount of pressure that has been put on the U.S. consumer. And if you look at spending, it really has been very, very resilient up to this point. But if you look at, uh, you know, where, where are consumers spending from, what we've seen is that spending habits have been supported this year based on savings rates. And we actually, right now, if you look at consumer savings, that savings rate is at the lowest level that we've seen since 2008. So that's really where, um, you know, in our, and, and this, is, this, is, this is our house view here, is that the recession's coming. It's just a matter of how long it takes for those, those, those catalysts that we're seeing play out right now um, really start to filter in through to spending, which ultimately translates into GDP, which translates into corporate earnings, which obviously uh, you know, comes back to, to drive equity prices in the long term. But at the same time, too, it, you, you could see this run for a while, right? That could take some time. Um, typically, you know, the tw 12 months prior to a recession, up until that recession starts, it's actually a fairly decent time period for equities where you see positive total returns in that period. So again, it goes back to the point that you can't just say, hey, I'm going to cash or I'm going, you know, ultra short, upping my interest, because that could cost you quite a bit of upside. It cause you to lag the market in a big way. Um, so we really think that really maintaining that exposure is, is very, very important here. Um, and then the first, you look at where, where, where does the pain start? The first three to six months within a recession typically are the most painful for, for equity investors. Yeah, yeah and, and, and of course, fixed income. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Joe, you want to go to the next slide here? I know I'm going a little, uh, a little long here. I'll try to keep, keep it to another five minutes or so. Um, yeah, no, you're great on time. Okay, good. I'll keep going. And, and just to, um, I, I think it's really interesting to, uh, I, I think what the equity market is seeing right now, what's, what's fascinating is, uh, you know, if you look at uh, Fed fund futures, they're, they're pricing in a couple more hikes, rate hikes this year. And then uh, the expectation is we see a bit of a taper off, slow that down this year. And then the expectation is actually that the Fed starts cutting rates in 2023. That is, a, in our view, again, is a very aggressive stance for two reasons. One, uh, again, similar chart to what we looked at on you know, two slides ago, but you look at the 10-year yield relative to where inflation is, never seen this, this inverted disconnect like we've seen now. Uh, again, higher interest rates are part of the remedy. Uh, tighter financial conditions in general, uh, i.e. equity prices in there, are part of the remedy to try to get that down. Um, so we really think that's an aggressive stance. And you know, the other thing, uh, specifically looking at the fixed income side of the house here, when you think about the last time we saw a situation like we're in now, where inflation is this high, the Fed's trying to tighten to get it under control uh, throughout the 1970s and, and early 1980s, it took a very long time to get inflation under control. You actually had the 10-year yield that from 1972 you know, went from about 6% uh, to close to 13 14% when it was all said and done. So that's a huge move that you've seen here. And that chart on the right there that we're looking at shows the year over year increase in the 10 year yield that we had to see uh, every, you know, pretty much every single year with the exception of one to finally get inflation under control. Now, is it, is it gonna be this bad now? Hopefully not. But the reason that we show this um, is, is it worth it for you to have that long dated uh, or long duration fixed income position in, in, within, in, inside of the book, we would argue that that is, you know, you're picking up dimes in front of a steamroller there. The yield is, is yes, it's more attractive than it's been in a while, but that yield also comes with, uh, you know, quite a bit of risk. If we see, again, this remedy, higher interest rates starts to play out um, like we've seen it play out uh, historically. And Joe, if you can go to that last slide a bit here, I want to I want to spend just a little bit more time on the fixed income side of the house here. Uh, you know, in particular, when you look at these strategies, you know, the buffer ETFs that Joe talked about uh, earlier, we, we we see these being used on both the equity side and as well as the fixed income side. 
Uh, clearly on the equity side, they can meaningfully dial down your volatility. Um, I would argue that a, a lot of these strategies add even more value uh, on the fixed income side of the book for, for the simple point that what they really allow you to do is deliver a similar risk profile or at least a similar volatility to what you can get from uh, a fixed income allocation. They allow you to sidestep a lot of uh, the potential challenges that we see, i.e. higher rates in, in the market. Uh, and then most importantly, why, uh, uh, you know, from a long-term perspective, why I think it makes a lot of sense is one of the things that you're doing with allocating to the buffer ETFs is that you're getting more equity exposure in your portfolio. You are now tying your safe dollars, which used to be tied to the fixed income market, and you're tying those safe dollars to the, to the experience of the equity market, which again, over the long term, uh, you know, should help to produce uh, meaningfully higher returns in a balanced allocation. And right now, I think the case is probably, you know, strongest it's ever been for the buffer ETFs on the fixed income side of the house. You know, if you think about why do we allocate to bonds in the first place, two different reasons. Number one is probably diversification benefits that you get from those allocations. A couple challenges that we see with that right now. If you look at that chart on the left-hand side, the correlation between equities and bonds right now is at a multi-decade high. You know, we have pretty much all year long been hanging, hanging out north of that 0.5 mark uh, from a correlation perspective. <clears throat> so you really haven't got any of those diversification benefits. And we really don't see those returning anytime soon for a couple of reasons. One, when you look at that, you know, think about what are the, the risks to the equity market? Again, those are the exact same risks that we see to the fixed income market. Inflation continuing to run, overly aggressive Fed, higher interest rates. Those risks are shared on both sides of the book so that you're not getting that correlation uh, or diversification benefit that you have historically uh, relied on from the equity sleeve. But also, you know, the other part of this too, and, and, and why you really, uh, you know, we don't anticipate this coming back in a big way anytime soon, is if you think about, uh, you know, really just the basics of how, how bonds work. You know, as yields fall, prices rise. So as equities, uh, or as nerves kick up in the equity markets, as nerves kick up in the economy, what happens is you have investors that sell their equities, they rush into bonds for safety, that pushes down yields, that raises prices, which provides that diversification benefits, right? And what I think is so interesting here, if you look at um, you know, the last four major uh, bear markets that we've seen historically, um, what you have seen is subsequently as that starting yield has come down, you know, we're in 2001, we were at 7% you know, bond, uh, bond yield at the equity market peak to 5% uh, to 2% to, to, to back in the COVID crisis. Uh, and what you notice here, if you look at that right-hand column, that core bond total return, as those rates, those starting yields have been become lower and, and lower, the protection that you've received from those allocations has been lower and lower. Simply for the fact is that as yields have more room to fall, you get more protection from them. But even with the jump that we've seen thus far this year, you know, it, it's still going to be a challenge to provide the type of uh, correlation and diversification benefits that we've seen, um, you know, from the fixed income side of the book. So, Joe, Joe do I have time for one more uh, quick comment? No, I'm running over here. But, but the last thing I'll, I'll leave you with on the fixed income uh, side here, uh, again, all of this aside, is, you know, when you look at return generation, I think that last piece I talked about is, you know, being able to tie your safe dollars now, uh, not to the bond market, but to the equity market, that's a really big deal, especially when you think about uh, really a traditional balanced allocation. Let's say you have 40% of your, your allocation in those, you know, investment grade, high quality bonds that are intended to provide you protection there. Um, what we have seen historically is pretty much when you look at something like the ag, you know, a, a core bond allocation, the starting yield that you buy in at uh, on those on that position is very close to what you're going to get from a total return perspective over the long haul. In fact, if you look at the ag, 95% of the ag's total return over the last 40 years has been explained by the starting yield. 
right? And there's, there's been very little deviation one way or the other. So if you look at where that would put us today, you, know, you think about the yield on the ag, let's say it's 375. Um, you know, th that means that in order to generate those high single digit returns in a 60-40 portfolio, you're going to have to, your, your equity portfolio is going to have to be doing a lot of heavy lifting. You know, you're going to have to be looking at, at a return in that 12 to 14% range every single year on your equity allocation. That's going to be very tough to do. Um, so we really think, again, um, with all of the challenges that we've seen today, uh, you know, with the fact that you know, the correlation benefits are not there, we really think the, the buffer ETFs can really come in um, and, and make a big difference in trying to help get those return expectations up and also sidestep a lot of the challenges that we're seeing within the fixed income markets today. So, Joe, I know I went a little bit over. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pass it back to you to uh, any remaining thoughts. Yeah, that's that's great, Tim. Really appreciate the insight. Um, so that's you know that's kind of just to summarize. You know, we've talked about what buffer ETFs are, what they're what they do, how they work, um, what risks they're addressing. Um, and Tim gave us a, a great sense of what's going on in the market right now, um, and and how that shapes how we think about and use buffer ETFs. Um, so now just. To, to wrap us up with our, I think we've got just a couple of minutes left. Here's a little bit of kind of where the rubber meets the road of, of our product lineup. What's available? What are the different buffer levels? What are the different indices? And I know it may look like, uh, may look like a lot going on on this screen, uh, but a lot of repetition. Um, so what we're looking at, these are all the tickers here uh, for our products. These are, again, they are, they are ETFs, so they are out and traded on an exchange can be bought and sold, uh, similar to you know other stocks and ETFs and traditional equities. Um, so they have those tickers on the S and P, which we just call U.S. large cap. Um, we do a nine percent, a fifteen percent, and that shifted thirty percent buffer. And the way that we have laid out our lineup is such that you're only ever a few weeks away from a new outcome period beginning. And so the way to participate in these is, you know, let's say we're, we're sort of kind of towards the beginning of August here, still almost mid-August. So there is an offering at a 9%, a 15%, and a 30% buffer level on the S&P that buffers between August of this year and August of next year. And you'll notice these tickers all follow the same pattern uh, with B being the 9% buffer, P being the 15%, and U for ultra being that 30%. So B, P, and U and the first three letters of the month um, are the way to do that. So now the, the question becomes, okay, it's, it's August 10th now, um, and we wanna participate in a 15% buffer how do we do that? Well, you could simply go in and, and purchase PAUG, which is the product that buffers from the beginning of August to August of next year. But the market has moved since August 1st. Um, you know, the, the, the pricing has changed. The S&P has moved. The product has moved. So what does that mean? Well, if you simply go to our website, innovatoretfs.com, you can see live pricing, and I may, if we have another moment, I may pull that up. You can see what your remaining cap or your remaining buffer are for any of these outcome periods. So I may look through the list and say, I like the payoff offered by the February 15% buffer. It's no longer a 15% buffer. Maybe it's showing 13% remaining buffer. Maybe it's showing 11% remaining buffer. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but in any case, you can find interim period opportunities and maybe have rather than a one-year outcome period, maybe I just want to have a defined parameter, defined outcome between now and February. And I can do that um, by simply looking at that February ticker, referencing the tools on our website, um, and simply buying that fund um, and holding it until February when I know it will achieve the full extent of that defined outcome. 
So that's on the S&P. Now, the same is true uh, for the other indices that we track. So U.S. growth would be QQQ or the NASDAQ 100. Uh, small cap is the Russell 2000. Uh, international developed and emerging markets, MSCI EFA and MSCI EM. Uh, those are the other, other indices that we have available. As you can see, because the S&P is, is you know, the most popular, uh, is always going to be the most popular that people look to for, for equity exposure. Uh, we've rounded out that, uh, that part of our lineup to the greatest extent where with these other indices, these non-S&P indices, we only do this 15% buffer level and we only offer them on the quarters. So you'll see that January, April, July, and October offering um, still with one year outcome period. So NJAN would be the NASDAQ 100 January to January. Um, but as far as the starting points of those outcome periods, uh, just on the quarters. So that's, um, yeah, please. So, so Joe, if you look at it and concentrate on the P jewel, okay, if you look at that from 21 to 22, mm -hmm. July of 21 to July of 22, there are two things I'd like to point out here. A, volatility is your friend when you're doing option strategies. So the cap for, for uh, July of 21 was only seven and a half percent, I believe, correct? Because yeah, seven, there was really no volatility in the markets this time last year. Hard to believe. <laughs> it was only a year ago we had no volatility. Yeah. Um, and then compared to July of 2022 to 23, we now have jumped up from seven and change to 17, which is truly amazing. But even more importantly, when you reset on July 1st, it's basically a tax-free reset. These are very, very tax efficient. Maybe yep. you could talk about that a little bit. Yep. Yeah, so the way that these funds achieve their outcome period or achieve their outcomes is over the course of that 365 day period. And as Tom mentioned, I've actually just got it pulled up here. You know, this was last year's ticker PJUL. Now, this fund, uh, you know, you were grateful to have the buffer in this case, despite having that lower cap going in, um, the buffer served you well. And you know, we saw that 7.8 cap, 15% buffer. So the fund reached the end of its outcome period with the market being down a little under 12% and the fund was just down its expense ratio. So it did exactly what it was supposed to do, hit day 365, achieved that defined outcome. Now, PJUL is still out there in trading. Uh, it still uh, is an active ETF. We didn't delist it, it didn't go to cash. Uh, it simply rebalanced and moved into a new outcome period. So if we look at PJUL today, we can see that it's still out. It started with, as Tom said, a significantly higher cap than we saw last year, uh, nearly 17.5% before fees. Um, and that is still out there in trading. And you know, we can reliably say if the market continues up from here and finishes the year above that cap, the product will simply get capped out come July of next year and rebalance into a new outcome period. So I, real quick, I have a question about this. Please. If in fact the end of July were today, okay? Because as of now, since July 1st, the, the S&P is up 11% and P Jewel is up 5.4, roughly, yep. give or take. Yep. If it were Ju July 1st of 2023, this particular ETF will be also up 11%, correct? Correct. It, would, it is designed, so just to kind of round out the payoffs in a different visual way than we looked at before, should the market be up here above that cap in that range, this product's getting capped out. It's getting that 1742 less fees. If the market, if in this case, SPY remains in this, uh, in this range here where it's positive, but it's still below the cap, you will see the value of that fund reflect one for one with what the market is. So in this case, it would have to trade up from that 5.4 level up to 11.29. Still have to factor in fees there, so it's not gonna be the exact one for one match. Um, but in any case, you're exactly right. If we fast forward to July 
uh, of next year, you will see that um, you will see that converge either to you know hit the cap if the market continues up, match the market one for one, or anywhere in this range, you know, realize the full extent of that buffer. So it is important to understand that these are not designed as a sort of you know daily buffered solution. They're designed to deliver that that defined outcome over the course of that full one year period. So that's why right now we're not seeing that full one-to-one -one participation. And if the market was down, we still wouldn't see the full extent of that buffer realize. You'll see a portion of it. You'll see a portion of that upside, right. but then you'll truly see defined outcome by day 365. Right. And this is why we like this as a bolt on to our other alternatives to lower the volatility or lower the data of our clients' portfolios at the same time. Um, Another bolt on, if you will, that would could be in, a, in accordance with this, the downside, let's look at the risk side. The downside is actually what the upside is, if you think about it, that there is no income that's being uh, spun off from these at all. So there, are, there, go, there goes your uh, tax efficiency, if you will. But our other alternatives in conjunction with this would provide some income, whether it's a hybrid fund or whether, whether it's a long short fund, whatever the case may be. So that is the one side. Let's, let's, let's talk about the risk side. Again, no income that's thrown off here. When you look at this versus structured notes, for instance, which we can bolt on structured notes to go ahead and add income in conjunction with a buffered ETF, um, there is no counterparty risk, right? I mean, the, unlike a, um, a structured note. I mean, let's, where is the risk here? I mean, the option market, which is huge and liquid, I guess if that goes out of business, I mean, where, where, yeah. where is the ultimate risk? Yeah, I mean, so the, the, the first risk, I mean, the clear and obvious risk is simply that you are p potentially foregoing some upside. You know, if the market really rips up, you're getting capped mm -hmm. out. That's a risk that you have. Now, what's the kind of blow up risk? What's the under the hood risk? Well, you're, you're exactly right. You know, we, we don't have uh, credit or counterparty risk in the way that something like a structured note would because these are simply ETFs that hold a basket of options. And those, that basket of options is backed and guaranteed by the OCC, the Options Clearing Corporation, which is one of our systemically important financial institutions, too big to fail organization with the backing of the Federal Reserve. So, in order for those options um, to not be able to be exercised in the way that they should, um, we would need, you know, the OCC to fail. Um, we need the exchanges to fail. We need sort of one of these, um, you know, full systemic meltdown situations. So that's that's important to highlight when you're looking at this in the ETF wrapper, is that it it's not on innovators balance sheet to make good on these types of payoffs um, in the same way that other structures offering these types of payoffs may be tied to a, you know, one individual financial institution. Um, you're not in this case, right. and that's really a benefit. Right, um, and, and again, as this is part of, and for the, the, the Schwabies on the calls, obviously we're you know, offering our non-discretionary uh, portfolios that we manage, but it, it's very important as, as a part of a piece of a very broad puzzle to, to mitigate that risk. And I think that what we run into is, especially during this time of volatility, and I know in this area down uh, outside of Philly, this is, can I even call this, or can we call this the annuity killer, the index annuity killer, where this provides liquidity and low cost, rather than being stuck into an annuity for 10 years and have a 10% surrender charge or whatever the case may be. Is not this the same, um, option uh, strategies that, that all the index annuities use? It is, uh, in a lot of cases it is. Um, so you may see um, identical or close to identical payoffs, maybe different buffer levels offered, uh, maybe slightly different time frames offered, uh, but ultimately, you know, that whatever that, you know, that insurance firm or that financial institution may be going out and, and hedging that promise that they've offered by buying a basket of options similar to this. Um, so we're in a sense cutting out, um, cutting out that type of middleman in these types in accessing these payoffs. Yeah. yeah. So 
uh, I had one last slide, which uh, you know we more or less covered there when looking at some of those previous outcome periods, but I think important to note, do these do what they're supposed to do? Um, the answer is yes. You know, we, we talked about the, the sort of blow up risks and the, uh, you know, what it would take for these to not do what they're supposed to do. Um, so if you look on our website, you can scroll through all kinds of uh, previous outcome periods. We've been doing this since 2018 now, um, so over four years um, and continuing to, you know, see these trade the way they're supposed to trade, deliver their payoffs they're supposed to deliver uh, in the way that they're supposed to deliver them using that efficient ETF wrapper. So that is all I had for today. Um, Tom uh, or Tim, if either of you had any sort of final uh, parting notes here, uh, let us know. Anything? Well, well, first of all, I, thank you very much. I mean, this is you know uh, another uh, tool in the toolbox, if you will. Uh, very, very important for us. And, and again, we, we are all about liquidity, all about low cost. And also, um, again, bringing down the beta of the overall portfolios is huge. And um, I just like to also say that we are ce celebrating a couple anniversaries. We're uh, only one of 17 firms on Schwab Advisor Network. This is our 26th year, I believe, starting in August. And um, I'm also starting my 41st year in the business, which it's very hard for me to believe. I still feel, feel very, very young. And, um, and uh, I can't uh, thank you gentlemen enough for the time to uh, educate both um, uh, our clients that are on this call and also uh, uh, for the, the Schwabies that are on this call. If anybody has any questions, please uh, reach out to us um, at MeyerCG.com. And um, I believe that's all the questions we have. And, and uh, again, thank you for your time and have a great night. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Con congratulations on the milestones. Yeah. Uh, thanks everyone for the time. And uh, please feel free to, uh, to submit any questions with the, um, just this last second left and we'll, uh, we'll take note of those and address, but we are out of time. Uh, so thank you, Tom. And thank you everyone for taking the time to join. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.